For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. When Joseph's brothers saw that the father was dead, they said, they said among themselves, what if Joseph should bear a grudge against us and pay us back in full for all the wrong which we have done to him? They sent a message to Joseph saying, your father charged before he died, saying, thus you should say to Joseph, please forgive, I beg you, the transgression of your brothers and their sin, for they did you wrong. Now please forgive the transgression of the servants of, the, of God uh, and of your father. And Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also came and they fell down before him and they said, Behold, we are your servants. So that fulfills that dream he had, didn't it? That dream that goes all the way back to when he was 17. Now he's 56. Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid, for am I in God's place. In other words, look, what did they want from Joseph? They wanted him to forgive them, right? And he says, that's not my, that, that's not my place. The sin that, see, even though sin can go both ways, it can be directed towards people. It's always directed towards God. Always, no matter how. And so that's what he's talking about. Uh, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. Now, once you understand that principle, once that principle gets in your head and you ought to read that until it does, you're never going to overcome self-condemning guilt. Never going to happen. Never going to happen. These guys have thought about this for 39 years. They've carried this in their soul. It's eaten them up internally. They just can't get it. And, you know, when something eats on you like that, you get into all kinds of wrong solutions. People get into alcohol. They get into binge eating. They get into all kinds of craziness. They get into all kinds of crazy relationships. They'll go three or four marriages. Don't know why none of them will stick. Uh, and then, you know, they have to resolve it so they can blame the other person or blame themselves or blame life or blame God. I mean, they get into a blame game, and that don't work. So eventually they just stay in this eat-up stage. And so here they are. Here they are. And what you meant for evil, listen to me, God meant for good. Now look. This is a great healing moment because, listen, they really did him wrong. I mean, attempted murder is about as tough as it gets. But, listen, God meant it for good. Now, that helps Joseph. Joseph says that's what you have to understand to get help for yourself. This is a great healing moment in their life if they want it. You know, you can go to the doctor, he can tell you what it is and tell you the solution. You go to the drugstore, you, you get the medicine, you take it home, you never take it. You don't know why you're not getting better. You go back to the doctor. He said, would well, you take your medicine? You go like, no. Look, a lot of, there have been a lot of good reasons in your head why you should be someplace else other than here tonight. But you're here. And you got to ask yourself a question, and that is, you know, of all the nights I did miss, how come tonight I'm here and I haven't missed? And this lesson is as much for you as it is for the other person that should have been here is not. You know, people walk out and say, boy, this I know who this lesson was for. Listen, the first person that has to go through that is the guy who teaches it. I mean, I have to go through say I have to go through and do all my laundry list checkouts before I can bring it. 
the father go like, you think, that, you think I gave you this message to give to them? No, I gave you this message to get to you. So we all go through that. So what you meant for evil against me, God meant for good. And listen, evil is worse than sin. Let me show you. Here are the brothers. They hate him. <laughs> they hate him. When they saw him coming down the road, they went, I hate him. <laughs> that's a sin. When you pull a gun and try to kill him, that's evil. That's evil. That ain't sin. That's beyond it. And the average guy in the street that don't go to church and don't have a Bible will tell you that's evil. What you just tried to do is evil. He'll tell you that. And, he, and he, you know how he speaks? He speaks from a conscience. Not from the Bible. They went way beyond. They went way, then they sold them into slavery to their enemy who drug them off to a, a foreign nation. Killed a goat. Put the blood on the goat and told their poor dad that he had been killed by a, a, a wild animal. Could find his body, must have ate it. I mean, how bad is that? Dad never got over it. He grieved for 39 years. He grieved for 39 years for this son who was alive. And the brothers kept it from their dad. But God meant all this for good. Well, there's something to wrap your brain around, isn't it? But God meant all that for good. You know the difference between these two guys in the family? Joseph understood it 39 years ago. They're just learning it. It don't matter when you learn it, but you better learn it. Because it'll eat your lunch. It'll call all, it will cause all your good days to be bad. Now I know you probably think, how do you know I was coming tonight? How did he know I'd be here? I bet somebody told him about this, and I bet he designed this just for, just to aggravate me. I wish I was that smart. I'm not. Now, he said God, God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result. And what would that be, you ask? He says to preserve, to preserve many people alive, two nations. All of that. Joseph put in the hands of God, and God saved two nations out of the famine. Israel and Egypt, both strategic uh, nations in the plan of God. So therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and for your little ones. So he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. Is that not healing? Well, somebody needs healing either in this room or through the internet somewhere in the world. And we'll sure help them tonight. We will sure help them after a word of prayer. Let's have a moment of prayer. Every head bowed, every eye closed. This offers you privacy. If you believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead the third day, if you believe that for your salvation, then you're saved. Paul calls that the gospel in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. Romans 1.16 says the, the, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. You don't get saved because you go to church. Any more if you sleep in a garage, you become an automobile. You've got to have personal faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ to be saved. If you believe that he died for your sins, you believe that he was buried and raised from the dead to give you eternal life, then you get it. When you are saved, because you live in the church age, the Holy Spirit takes up residence. The Holy Spirit, the third member of the Godhead, takes up residence inside your body. And he is there forever, John 14, 16. And your body has now become the temple of God. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. That Holy Spirit dwelling inside your body is to cause you to be a spiritual person. If you will look to him, and allow him to do this, he will make a spiritual person out of you. When you walk in the spirit, you will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. 
because you're a spiritual person, you have spiritual equipment to make this journey in your life as a spiritual person. Not by your own works. You weren't saved by it. You're not, you don't live by it. You live by the power of God. In order to be spiritual, you have to be sure the Holy Spirit who lives in you is able to teach you the Word of God. The only reason he couldn't is because you're carnal. You have personal sin in your life that's not confessed, and that personal sin could be mental attitude sins. It could be overt sins. It could be sins of the tongue. Those at least be three categories, and if you're aware of any, you should confess them now in privacy before we start to study. Otherwise, this is going to be a void hour because you can't study the Bible as a carnal believer. Can't study it in the flesh. It's a spiritual book for spiritual people for spiritual life. First John 1 John 1.9 says, If you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you. And that takes you out of carnality, the flesh, and puts you into the spirit who lives in you to teach you the truth of the word of God. I'm going to give you a moment to do that. You know what God, why he's brought you in here tonight. You know what you need to confess. You know that in your heart, and you need to name it or cite it and state it to God. He says, if you confess your sins, I am faithful just to forgive you and to cleanse you. Father, we're so thankful tonight for your love and mercy and grace. We pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of the Word of God tonight on this thing of self-condemning guilt and how to be resolved over it, how to get us, how to absolutely get resolution in this area of our life. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, here we are. If you have a study guide, I took verse 15. And I wrote it out into three parts that are important for you to see tonight. When Joseph's brothers saw that the father was dead, they said collectively and then, then addressed this question or this statement to Joseph. Their concern was, what if Joseph, one, two, three, watch this now, first bears a grudge against us. This word grudge in the Hebrew, satam, as a callum perfect, is the same word for grudge in the English. So it doesn't, it's not complicated. I mean, we understand what a grudge is, don't we? Right? Usually they're short termed. Usually people work through a grudge, they get re resolution to it, they, because it's too much to bear. It's too big a burden. And if you don't get it resolved right away, listen to me, it can manifest itself. It takes on a life of its own and develops a whole lot of other things connected to it. If, it, if you allow it to fester, it's, it's like a disease that just begins to spread into all different places of your body. I mean, at one point it was here and because you didn't treat it or get it taken care of, now it's all over and it's spread throughout your body. And by the time it comes to resolve it, it's become a very complicated thing. The doctor says, you know, if you'd have, if you'd have come to me a year ago, this would have been an easy fix. Now we're in, we're in a mess. We'll try to clean this up, but now we got a mess. Are you with me? Now, the difference between that doctor and God, God can clean that sucker up in a, in a hurry. He can clean it up in a hurry. But you got to, you've, you've got to be willing to do it his way. And if you're interested in that, this night, for the next couple of weeks, I'm going to be dealing with this subject. You need to put yourself into that position where you can get this thing cleaned up. I promise you, we can get it up and out. We can clean your life up. It'll take the power of God, not the power of man, but God is a, a God of healing. He's a God of healing. Would you agree with that? If there's one thing you know about God, God's a healer. And this will take this. So they come, they said, what if Joseph bears a grudge against us? Now they don't know that he, he's not. He's not going to do it. You know why he's not going to hold a grudge? Because it would hurt him more than them now. Because this would become, self, this would become a self-inflicted wound. 
right? It'd be a self-inflicted wound. I mean, if they stabbed you once, and now you stab yourself all the time. And so, listen, what God's got to do is first thing, he's got to get the knife out of your hand so they can heal you. Because that guilt goes like, whatever they did, you do to yourself. You understand that? And this becomes perpetual, and it gets worse because you started with one wound, and now you've got them all over yourself. So we've got to get the knife out of your hand and get your attitude towards God where he can heal you. This self-condemning guilt, whatever somebody did, you keep doing it to yourself. And as you know by now, it doesn't work. Did I? So I don't have to tell you that. What if Joseph bears a grudge against us? Number two, what if he pays us back in full? <laughs> you know what paying back in full is? Giving it back to me plus interest. Now, I don't know how bad this would get because they were going to kill him and decided to sell him into slavery to, a, to an enemy. So I don't, that's like selling you off to ISIS or something. I don't know where they think, full, what they mean by full, but it's the worst they could imagine. When it says, what if he pays me back in full, is, is wor the worst they could imagine is what they mean by full. And for those in Hebrew that are familiar with Hebrew, notice that that's the word Shub, and it's doubled up. Like when we say, die and you shall die, in, in, in uh, Genesis 2.17, don't eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and the day you eat, die and you will die, is what it says in Hebrew. That, that's the same doubling up of the word, and it means something so absolute that nothing else you could imagine could correct it. Could correct it. And that's what they just said. When they said, pay us back in full, the third thing, for all the wrong, this word for wrong is kind of an interesting word because the word is ra'ah in Hebrew, and it means evil. It don't, it, listen, when somebody wa wants to white coat it, you know, whitewash it, they would call it wrong. The truth of the matter is, it was evil. And the truth of the matter is that the guy who experienced it told him it was. You met what? Evil against me. But God made it good. Now they're trying to make it good, aren't they? But you see, they're 39 years late because Joseph already gave that to God. And it don't matter, listen, they're, they're going to help their, their, he's going to help their brothers get healed. The guy who was injured is going to help the brothers get healed. But you see, when somebody does evil to you and calls it wrong, that's sugarcoating. That's what washing. It's really evil. What if Joseph has a grudge against what we did, we did wrong. No, you did evil. <laughs> you did evil. But I gave it to God. And you know what God gave me back? You gave me evil. I gave the evil to God that you did to me. You know what God gave me? What God give him? <laughs> they gave him evil. He took the evil and gave it to God. And what did God give him? Good. Come on now. See that, how that works? This is not complicated. The only reason it's complicated in your life right now is I'm years, I'm years away from that event in your life, and you've been stabbing yourself ever since. So, you know, we got a few wounds to heal, but we can get them all healed up. But you got to learn. you got to learn this, this simple procedure. What one person meant for evil, you give it to God. Got to take that. That's, that's why Christ, that's what Christ is all about in this world. Taking that and turning it back into something what? 
good. And this is not good in human terms. This is good in God terms. God gave me good. Don't matter whether they give what, listen, it don't matter what they give him. They might give him more wrong, more wrong, more wrong. Listen, he got, he's learned how it works. Every wrong that somebody gives me, I give it to God. God gives me what? <laughs> yeah, come on now. Happy days, happy days. Since Jesus Christ washed my sins away. Happy days, happy days. Since Jesus Christ washed my sins away. Hmm? Remember that little song in church? I wonder how he'll treat us with all the wrong we did to him. This is going to be a happy day for them when he hears these words from them. He says, look, I'm going to give you what God gave me. I'm not going to give you back evil for evil. I don't have it anymore. I gave it away. <laughs> I don't have it anymore. I gave it away. Well, who'd you give it to? I gave it to God, the only one that could turn it into something good. Got to be willing to give it to God so that he can turn it into good. Give it to God so he can turn it into good. Give it to God so he can turn it into good. Give it to God. Happy days, happy days, since Jesus Christ washed my sins away. You know that? He taught me how to watch and pray and to go rejoicing every day. Happy days, happy days, since Jesus washed my sins away. That's an absolute truth. Not just a song. It's an absolute truth. We underlined, we underlined in that little verse 15, which ought to be your verse, we underlined how self-condemning guilt, how the thinking of it works in the lives of a believer in looking at the ten brothers. This lesson tonight will look at four aspects of our first part in the series of self-condemning guilt. Actually, what has happened to the brothers is what we call collective guilt. Collective guilt. Listen to this. Collective guilt because all ten brothers conspired together against Joseph. Collective guilt can can be manifested by a family like the ten brothers got together. They got together and pulled, they all pulled one trigger. That's collective guilt. Uh, a family, it can be in a family, it could be in a tribe, it could be in a region of a nation. We've been guilty of that in the south. The north has their guilt, and the east has theirs, and the west has theirs. I mean, we, we, they, everybody's got their own stuff. Uh, nation, it could be international guilt. Collective is a big deal. Notice how we can identify it in verse 15 by the words us and we. Now, there's 10 brothers. Now, there's 12 in the tribe, Joseph, but, but Benjamin, of course, was young. He, didn't, he wasn't part of this. He was at home uh, with dad. So we had 10 brothers involved in this. And when they speak, they speak for the unit. Did you notice that? Us and we? See, it's not me. It's us and we. <laughs> because it was collectively done. They were in agreement. It was a conspiracy. It was a plot together. They are guilty in theory because they all pulled the trigger together at the same time by collective guilt. Guilt and guilty by association in the same act. Yet each must deal, now listen to me, yet each must deal with it as personal sin against the Lord as well as against Joseph. That's why they're all standing there individually, collectively, but yet individually. Collective guilt was true. With sin. I used to run in collective guilt in prison ministries. The guys would do something as a gang. They may have not been the guy that pulled the trigger, but they were the guy that put their finger on the trigger and somebody else pulled it. 
And they wound up in prison for the crime. And they felt absolutely innocent. I did not shoot the man. But they were guilty by association in the crime as if they put their finger on the trigger because of the plot to assassinate or to kill or whatever. Collective guilt was true with Satan. Listen, this happened in the, in the garden. In the garden of Gethsemane, you had a, a collective conspiracy. You had Satan, Eve, and then Adam collectively, and God, God dealt with them collectively and then individually. He put a curse on the serpent, put a curse on the woman, put a curse on the man, and then put a curse on the rest of us. It's called the damnic sin. You can read about it in Genesis 3. And even while there's collective guilt, each must, when they come to the Lord for forgiveness, each must come as personal sin. Stephen, in Acts the seventh chapter, when Stephen is giving a great message about the coming of Christ to save Israel, Stephen is charged. Stephen charge is, charges Israel with collective guilt because as a nation, they murdered their Messiah. And he brings that to them. Listen, he doesn't bring to them to condemn them. He brings them to them so they can get forgiveness. He doesn't do that to condemn them. He does it to give them freedom from this collective guilt that will eat their lunch every day of their life or periodically throughout their life. So in Acts, the seventh chapter, 51 through 53, he gets in this discussion and they respond negatively to it. In Acts 7, 58 through 60, it's important because I want to show you while he's charging them as collectively as a nation guilty of killing their Messiah, the Savior of the world. He offers each of them an opportunity to come to the Lord personally. And so he, he mean, and there's a statement in there that's important. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their clothes. We're talking about the witnesses against Stephen who say he should die for saying that about us. They killed the Messiah. Now they're going to kill the messenger. And they take their garments off to show that they are willing to take whatever heat there is to kill this guy. And they lay their clothes at the feet of the young man called Saul. This is Saul of Tarsus. Who has the authority for this execution. He has permission from the court to put to death anybody that makes this kind of declaration against Israel. While they were stoning him, Stephen prays, listen to this, this is a prayer that you would have heard Joseph pray. Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. That's pretty powerful, isn't it? You know how a guy can pray that prayer to somebody who's doing evil against him? Because he knows how to shift the evil to the Lord in order to get good. And we could go story after story in the Bible of people who have learned that lesson. If you learn that lesson, you'll get free. If you don't lesson, learn the lesson, uh, you'll be in worse shape when you leave here than you were when you came. Because the Lord has spoken to your heart in a very strong way from the Word of God. Now, let me ask you a question. If you know anything about biblical history, this is a prayer he prayed. Lord Jesus, he prays this prayer. Let me ask you a question. Did God answer this prayer of Stephen for those engaged in his stoning? You know the guy he got? This is chapter 7. In chapter 9, he converts Saul of Tarsus on the way to Damascus. He converts him to Christ. Hoo -ah. Hoo -ah. See that prayer answered? Now he's dead. Stephen is dead. And God answered his prayer.
And maybe he got to see it. Who knows? In Acts 9, 20, chapter, chapter 9, chapter 22, and chapter 26, Paul talks about his conversion. You know what I love? Boy, God just don't go after any old buddy either when he goes after somebody. He went after the ringleader, didn't he? Because he knew his influence. Went after the ringleader. I love that. Yet Saul, yet Saul of Tarsus had to deal with it personally. L listen, to, listen to Paul's testimony in 1 Timothy. Listen to this. This is pretty powerful. Now, he was out to kill all Christians and to sh silence them and get the, stop, uh, keep them from bringing charges against Israel. I mean, 1 Timothy 1 on your paper, 12 through 17. Listen to what Paul says now. He says, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord. This is a guy that was on the... Listen, when he left this group of guys, he just stopped off to do a little business murder business, on his way to destroy the, all Christians and, and the church of Jesus Christ. And you, ought to read, uh, you ought to read how it talks about it in Acts 9. And here is the guy. This is the guy. I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has strengthened me because he has considered me faithful putting me into ministry. Even though I was formerly a blasphemer against Christ, a persecutor against Christ, a violent aggressor against Christ, yet I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. You know, grace is a powerful product, isn't it? And grace, the, and the grace of our Lord was more abundant with the faith, love, which are found in Christ Jesus, it is a trustworthy statement, deserving full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners among whom I'm foremost of all. And then he goes on and discussed more in that detail. Listen, did God turn something that was meant for evil into good? In a most powerful way. The human soul. Here's the second thing. The timeline in our story in Genesis, the timeline of self-condemning guilt of the ten brothers covers at least 39 years. That's a long time to carry a dead man around. Could you imagine a guy dies and he's strapped to your back and you've got to carry him for 39 years? That's what self-condemning guilt is. It's carrying a dead man, something that should not be in your life. You should not be carrying that. What are you doing with that? Well, my uncle died. We didn't have no th place to bury him, so I just put him on my back. Wouldn't that be kind of silly? I suppose you could get a date quick with that deal, right, after about 10 years. After about five days, according to the Bible, you couldn't get a date because you would really stink. You wonder why your life is going the way it is. This is not brain surgery. This is not difficult to figure out. You know it. Look, you keep carrying a dead person around. All God wants you to do is give it to him. L let me give him a proper burial. No, I've carried him this long. I guess I can carry him the rest of my life. I've carried him this far. far well, where are you carrying him to? I don't know, but I'm just carrying him. Well, don't you think it's time to get rid of that? That monkey on your back? Yeah, well, I don't care. Where am I going to we'll put him? Who would take him? Lord, I don't want him, but the Lord will. Now all I can do is tell you. You know, all I can do is tell you. Listen, when this whole thing started, Joseph was 17 with a dream. And he told his dad and his brothers about the dream. And in chapter 37... And in chapter 37, they plot to murder him. In chapter 30, 37, they actually sell him into slavery. 
And you should read Genesis 40, not now, but you should read Genesis 42, uh, 21 and through 23, because that's really interesting to this story. When Joseph, 13 years later, in Egypt, Joseph becomes prime minister. Now, this is a very key piece of information for us. That's in, that's in uh, Genesis 41, 46. So that's a 13-year difference. That's 13 years in Egypt. Listen, you talk about God. He walked in there a slave. But you see, when he got out of that pit, he gave that evil to God, and God gave him good. He walked into Egypt a good man. Not a man full of guilt, not a man full of evil, not, full of, uh, not a guy who was stabbing himself all over the place. Wonder why nobody would have anything to do with him. Because you're a little wacky. Oh, he walked in there, a good man with God. And in 13 years, as a slave, in a different nation, in a different culture, with a different language, he was second man in command to Pharaoh. Pharaoh did nothing without running it through Joseph first. That's what, a good, that's what God can do with a good man. Not a guy walking around with a dead, with a dead, a dead man on his back. Then we have the seven years of plenty, right? Then there's seven years of famine. In the, in the second year of famine, of course, according to Genesis 45, Jacob moves the whole family to Egypt. We're told in Genesis 47, 28, that Jacob lived, uh, J Jacob lived 17 years in Egypt and then died. So when we do the math, and everybody should check my math, as you know. But when we do the math, the years of self-condemning guilt, carrying this dead man on his back, that should not necessarily have been carried, right? No need to do that. Once you give it to God. Well, I don't think he'd want it. Uh, well, he says he does. <laughs> he says he does. And it seems to be he did it in the Old Testament, he did it in the New Testament. So we got something going here. So if we add 13, 7, 2, and 17 again, we get 39 years. This person has been eaten from the inside out for 39 years, and it's not necessary. We call that self-induced misery. Ain't nobody doing that to you. You're doing it to yourself. Now you're poking yourself. Well, what should I do with it? Give that to God. I mean, this is not brain surgery. If this was difficult, I couldn't figure it out. Thirty-nine years is too long. Let me tell you, one year is too long. Now, I don't know where you are in this process, but both by the Internet, and I don't care if you're in China tonight. Everybody's got guilt. You know, it's a common, term, it's a common word in all cultures, like God. Here's the third thing. These brothers are suffering from self-inflicted root of bitterness. Joseph is now 56 years of age. That's taken 17 and adding 39. Unlike his brothers, he's lived 30, the last 39 years without this type of old man baggage. That, that's old man Cosmos Diabolicus baggage. This is stuff you picked up from the world you didn't pick up from God. You know what God would have told you? Give that to me. Bundle that thing up and give it to me. Get, I want you to write down on a piece of paper all that gobbledygook stuff you got in your soul. <laughs> Get all that. Throw that all up. Put it on a piece of paper and have a ceremony and burn it. No, not outside where we're going to have a forest fire. Do something symbolic in your life with God that says, I'm giving that to God, and I'm not picking it up again, and just so you won't pick it up again, we're going to burn it. And walk away and understand out of the Word of God that He says, I will put good in its place. Only God can do that. Nobody else in this whole wide world can do that for you. Only God. 
If you were smart, you'd have that little ceremony with God at some point in your life when you mean business. Because God always means business. You come to God and you want something, you talk to him about it, he, you're going to get it. Are you prepared to get it? You've been with that monkey a long time. You're willing to get rid of that monkey? I don't know. I mean, he's become a pet. Right? He's become a pet. And it's true. I mean, a lot of people can't give up their pet. They got this monkey on their back. They can't give it up. They've made a pet out of it. It's become part of their life. They hate him. They wish they didn't have that monkey. But they've made a pet. I want, you to, I want you to open your Bibles. I wrote it on your paper, but I want your eyes to look on the Bible. Sometimes it's better, at least for me. I want my eyes. So I'm in Hebrews. I'm going to show you something in Hebrews that's really important to my subject matter. I'm in the 12th chapter of Hebrews. I'm looking at verse 14 and 15. When you keep that thing in there, he's going to talk about a root of bitterness. When it gets to that stage, there are many roots. There are many roots that wind up with the root of bitterness. See, that's singular. <laughs> but there's a lot of little things here that have contributed because you've allowed that to fester. There, it takes on a life of its own. Uh, and, and these things become self-inflicted wounds in that, and you wind up with a hard heart. You just wind up bitter. You wind up hard-hearted. So here's Hebrews, the 12th chapter, 14 and 15. 14's positive, 15's negative. 14. Pursue, pursue peace. That's inner peace. That, listen, when you have the peace with God, then you're able to have peace with people. When you're not at peace with God, you're never going to be at peace with people. They've always got to do something to keep you in the game, to keep you interested, or you don't play. You don't go because you like it, because you're getting something. If I don't get something, I'm out of here. Now he says to pursue, pursue peace so that that peace you can give to other people free. No, no strings attached, not looking for anything back. I'd like to be with you just because I'm full of peace. I got a lot of peace to give you. Not a peace of mind. Right? They get enough of that. I'm talking about the peace of peace with God. I'm at peace with God. You step into my life, this is what you're going to experience. You're going to experience the peace with God. That's who I am. Just call me peace with God. That's who I am. That's what he's talking about here. Pursue peace with all men and the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. Sanctification, that's the power of the Holy Spirit in me. Sanctification, being set apart under the holiness of God. That sanctification, experientially, that sanctification allows the Holy Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, and goodness, right? Oh, yeah, Galatians 5, 22, 23. And you know one of the words in that? Peace. Joy, peace, love. So you see, I don't have to, I don't have to self-manufacture it. I go to the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And he produce, so he tells me to pursue, pursue peace at all times with all people. Even, even when they're, uh, even when they're not good, even when they're, uh, 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 even when they're, uh, 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 when, even when they're uh, uh, to me, even when they're uh, uh, to me, I'm still, yeah, pursue peace with all men. How? How can I do that? Ministry of the Holy Spirit, the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit will produce what? Peace, joy, love, patience, supernatural production. That's how you do it. Because you've learned to give things to God. You've learned to give Him the bad things because He gives you the good thing. You give Him the bad. I know it's a bad deal, but that's what Christ died on the cross for. It's not without cost, but it's no cost to you. The cost is to the Father and the Son. So that you can experience by grace. So He says, 
Pursue peace with all men and the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. Verse 16, verse 15, listen to it. So see to it. That's a kind of an interesting thing. We still use that today, don't we? See to it. If somebody works for you, you tell them that all the time. See to it. See to it that the bathrooms are clean. See to it that the park yard's clean. See, the parking lot's clean. See to it that the products are aligned. See to it, right? We, see, we do this all the time. And what does that mean? We, we want you to pay attention. Would you agree with that? We want, we want you to stay focused on this. We do this all the time. Now watch it. He uses this phrase. He says in verse 15, See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God. Now how do you come short of it? You pull up short. See, you give it to God, what will God give you? In grace, he'll give you, he'll replace it with, you know what, you know what the opposite of evil is? Good. <laughs> you know what the opposite of hate is? Love. See what I mean? You give that to him, he gives this to you. Whoa. You say, well, that don't sound like much a deal. I know. It's it, the only way that deal works. It's through Jesus Christ. That's the only way that deal work, works. It don't work just you and God. It works you, Christ, and God. That's how that thing works. No man comes to the Father except through me, Jesus said. <laughs> Aren't you glad you came today? See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God. That, that, then he uses the second that. Notice there's two that's. There's a first that and a second that. See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God. See to it. See to it that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, and by it many are defiled. You know, it's... Let me tell you, this kind of a life is drinking poison thinking somebody else is going to die. <laughs> Yeah. What you drinking? Oh, a uh, glass of poison? Why are you doing that? Well, there's a couple of people in this room I was hoping would die. Well, lots of luck with that idea. That's what this, this, this kind of a life that these brothers have been living 39 years, that's what they've been doing. So, Here's the truth. Joseph practiced 1214, and his brothers practiced 1215. Do you understand that? You know who's got the root of bitterness? Joseph don't have the root of bitterness. He don't have it. Guess who's got it? Bubba. The Bubba brothers. The Bubba brothers have got it. The Bubba brothers. All the Bubba brothers. They got it. And they're sick of it. They want, they want out of it. I hope you're sick of it. Because you can get out of it. Oh, it's up to you. I mean, it's not brain surgery. If you are in Hebrews 12, 15, the root of bitterness, if you're in the root of bitterness, God wants to give you peace through sanctification. That's what he wants. I'm so troubled. I'm so upset. I just can't say that. And my life is just, uh, and, I, and I, I just go off and I do this to thinking that will resolve it, but it doesn't. It just leaves me with more issues. And then, then I think, oh, okay, uh, okay, I'll stop going to the bar and I'll start going to the gym. Well, I've been going to the gym and it don't help me either. What am I going to do? I guess I'll stop and I'll go to, <laughs> I go to Florida and live on the beach a while. That'll do it. Oh, no, that didn't do it. 39 years later, you're kids carrying a dead man on your back because you won't get rid of it. Now it's a pet. I don't know what to tell you. I mean, this is not brain surgery. This is not difficult. You got to make a couple decisions. Get rid of the monkey. You've made a pet out of it in your life. You wouldn't know how to get along without it. So God brought you in and said, look, we need to have an exchange system going here tonight. There needs to be an exchange. Give me your gobbledygook and I'll give you something that's good. 
Cast all your cares on me because I care about you. Did you know that verse? Cast all your anxieties upon him. Why are you carrying that monkey? You don't know what to do with it. Give, it, give the monkey to somebody who created it. I'm talking about a, a live monkey. Four. Listen. By the time you get to the root of bitterness, there have been all kinds of things that should have been addressed. It should have been addressed to keep you out of the root of bitterness with the brothers. For example, in Genesis 37, 4, they hated their brother. They should have dealt with hate because hate turned into evil. This sin of hate turned into evil. Murder! A plot to murder! I mean, even them, they must have went like, whoa! I mean, ten guys together, and somebody said, well, let's murder them. And somebody said, that sounds like a good idea. Well, who's going to pull the trigger? Not me. Not me. Not me. Not me. Not me. Well, I'll do it. Okay, we'll give whoever will do it ten dollars. I'll do it. Ten dollars. I'd do anything. There's always one guy, right? There's one idiot. You always have that idiot. Root of hate. Here, here, that root of bitterness, it came out of the mental attitude, sin of hate. They hated their brother. That's way back in 37. I'm in verse 50. Jealousy, 37, 11. They're jealous of Joseph. And listen, by the way the father treated him. Instead of hating their father, they hated him because their father showed favoritism. Their father, and he did because Joseph loved, I mean, uh, Jacob loved his mother more than life itself. He was madly in love with this woman all of his life. And when she died, had it not been for the two sons she gave him, he, the breath would have left his life. Now he's lost, he thinks, one of the sons of her. And they hate because the way the father... Listen, it's not because of your father. Listen, jealousy is your issue. How the father shows favoritism, that's, that's another issue. But you turned his favoritism into your monkey on the back. Come on now. That's your excuse. Well, dad never gave me that. Remember when the, when, the, when the prodigal son returned and the elder brother who was always at home, always the good guy at home, and the prodigal showed up? Well, you never did that for me. I guess, it, I, guess I should have ran off with a bunch of whores and come back, and you'd have, you'd have liked me. I mean, where does that come from? Where does that come from? I guess I could say all that tonight on, t on <laughs> off the internet. Yeah, off the internet. <laughs> Too late. Too late. <laughs> malice. We see malice when they plot to murder. Malice. That's gone way out. That's taking jealousy to a to another level. That's taking hate to a whole nother level. But the Bible tells you he who hates his brother and can't forgive will wind up, listen, has thought murder. That, uh, it's all set up. And I'm just telling you, this, this stuff, and, and so we got malice, and, and I'm just showing you uh, all that. And what we have, because these things are not dealt with, this is self-inflicted, more self-inflicted. <laughs> Until we got all that, now we got the root of bitterness. But none of that should have been necessary. None of it should have been necessary in your life. Maybe nobody told you, but somebody's telling you tonight. As they say, I'm on top of the church preaching. I'm telling you the absolute truth. I backed it up with the Word of God and the favor of God. Come on now. So what we got when it gets here, the root of bitterness is a hard-hearted heart. A hard-hearted heart. How did that go? <laughs> I think I was thinking of a song or something. I'm about ready to dance here. I want to close with this. I want you to put your eyes on it. I want you to go to Ephesians with me. I want you to put your eyes on this. I want you to look in your Bible. Your Bible. The 
last two verses of the chapter, Ephesians 4. Because in Hebrews it says, Ben, don't let you, don't get this root of bitterness in you over something that's occurred down here. Hate is turned into this. Jealousy is turned into this. Malice is turned into this. Don't let that happen. And if it does, it's a little tougher, but you got to get rid of it. It would have been a lot easier down here, a little tougher up there. Listen to what he says. Listen to what he says. Now listen to this. This is really important. Then we're going to close. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger, clamor, slander be put away from you. You know who's supposed to do that? You take the monkey off your back. Quit making a pet out of it. Put, away, put it away from you along with all malice. And this is what you are to replace it with. Now God will do this for you. If you will give him that, right? If you will give him that, wouldn't that be a good thing to get rid of? Come on now. That's a bunch of junk. That's not antique hit stuff. That's junk. Here's what he'll give you. If you, there needs to be an exchange. You give me this, here's what I'll give you. This is what he says he'll give you. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving, just as God in Christ forgave you. See, that's what he gave you. It's all based on your relationship with Christ. Get the monkey off your back, put Christ on it. Listen, get the monkey off yours and you get on the back of Jesus. Get rid of that dead corpse. You've made a pet out of it. Get rid of it. You know what, it, you know what that's doing in your life? It's destroying your ministry of Christ in your life. Keeps you silent. Who am I to say anything about Christ? Who am I? Who am I? Who am I? Who am I? You're born again. What do you mean, who are you? You're a child of God. You found your identity in Christ. He's a priest. You're a priest. He's a son. You're a priest. He's a child of promise. You're a child of promise. He's a priest. You're a priest. He's an heir. You're an heir. That's called positional truth in Christ. Walk around with this monkey in your back. You don't have any ministry. That monkey's taking all your ministry away. People stay away from you because you got a monkey on your back that's dead. It's been there 39 years. Listen, you've, you're able now to forgive as forgiven. Do you see that in verse 32? You're able to love because of the love. The love of God has been put in your heart. Now you're able to do that. You're able to love as you've been loved. You're able to, uh, uh, to, to be tender with other people the way you've been, he's been tender with you. Let's pray. Every about every eyes closed. Want that monkey off your back? Time to get it. How many years you've been carrying that thing? It's been two, one year too long. I'll tell you that. You give it to God. You give it to God. When you go home tonight, you write it all out on a piece of paper. You give it to God and you burn it so you don't carry it anymore. Don't put that monkey back on your back. Every time the devil reminds you that, where's your monkey? You tell him, I don't have it anymore. I gave it to God. Where's your monkey? I loved your monkey. Where's your monkey? I never saw anybody carry a dead monkey. You tell him, no. Get rid of that thing tonight. Tell God you're ready to get rid of it. I'm ready. You get rid of that thing tonight. You have your own ceremony with God. and Get rid of that thing. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful tonight for these that have come our way to study with us by automobile and by internet. There are a lot of people in the world like this tonight. Believers in Jesus Christ don't know how simple it is to get the monkey off their back. God will replace it with the very thing you need for restoration, for rebuilding your life. 
to find the joy that's been absent, the peace that's been absent, the tender heartedness that's been absent, the love that's been absent, the ministry that's been absent. Like Saul of Tarsus, become a new man, Paul the Apostle. Become a new man in Christ. We thank you for this tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life.